Take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you for pausing your lunch to enjoy this conversation with us. Um, as was described, HealthSpotter is a network for innovators and investors who are focused on healthcare transformation. And we particularly enjoy working with companies who have the ability and the interest to take an expertise from an industry outside of healthcare and apply it to an urgent need in healthcare, such as Tempest is doing uh, in the pursuit of precision cancer care. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and it's a real privilege to be here. Eric, you're a technologist first and foremost, and as I said, you're pursuing now to apply some of the expertise and success that you've had in applying technology to other industries to uh, the delivery of precision cancer care. Can you start by sharing uh, with the audience the biggest challenge that you think, uh, the biggest problem you think that we need to address if we're going to make personalized medicine in pursuit of cancer therapy a reality? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, the, the, it's, it's easy. It's one word, it's data. Um, you know, we've spent the last, or I've spent the last 20 years uh, basically structuring unstructured, messy data and bringing technology to industries that have not had a lot of technology, printing, logistics, local commerce, manufacturing. And <clears throat> when I was um, dealing with somebody who was uh, battling cancer, I was just perplexed at how little data had permeated her care. And that started me on this journey to figure out uh, why, you know, where was the data that you would want these physicians to have to make life and death decisions. You start to realize the more you dig into it that the basic data infrastructure in cancer and probably in all healthcare is just fundamentally broken. That the clinical data you need, a key phenotypic therapeutic and outcome response data is largely locked inside these big medical record systems that were largely built to pay bills. They're, 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 they're sophisticated systems, but they're transactional in orientation. And so it's very hard to get that data and query it and structure it and analyze it. And at the same time today, in order to really understand what's going on at a patient level, you have to combine that data with molecular data. Mm -hmm. You have to start to look for these patterns and signatures that exist at a broad molecular level. And so that means you have to get clinical data and structure it. You have to combine it with molecular data. And you can, if you do both those things, you can begin to see patterns that are uh, relevant. And the, the challenge we have um, in, in, in cancer care is that that basic data infrastructure just doesn't exist. It's com completely non-existent. So it's a bit like going back in time, you know, talking about a, a, a world of cable TV when there's no cable. There's just three or four television stations, and the very first thing you have to do is wire up the cable. And I, I actually remember, you know, my neighborhood being dug up and people were wire, you know, laying cable. And then all of a sudden, you had a lot of television stations. And the same thing has to happen in healthcare, and that's what Tempest is doing. I've heard you describe this as the absence of an operating system in healthcare. Can you explain that metaphor to this audience? What do you mean by that? I mean, you know, basically, the, the, if you think about how this is likely to evolve, the first step is you have to get the data out. You have to get it clean and structured. And, but once you get it out, you have to do something with it. Otherwise, you just have a lot of data. And so I envision this happening in waves. But probably the first wave is uh, companies like Tempest will begin to move data in mass out of these uh, large electronic medical records or, or EHR systems. We'll put it somewhere, combine it with other data, um, bring tools to the process that make that data you know, um, rich and provide insights to physicians or researchers, and then we'll dump that, those insights back into the uh, medical record system so that tests can be ordered and uh, bills can be paid and you've got a clean medical record. And that, that, that tool set is an operating system. So it's in much the same way as when we, when we first were building computers you know, 30 or 40 years ago. They, they weren't smart. You just had a lot of components. And I think the, likely that's what's going to have to evolve here. You're going to have to get the data in one place and then make that data smart by building a series of tools around it. Um, the, the challenge, not to digress for a minute, but the, the challenge here is um, uh, remarkable in that you have these two massive technology paradigm shifts hitting cancer, probably, again, the broader healthcare system at one time. You have the uh, dramatic reduction in the cost of generating molecular data, and then you have advancements in artificial intelligence uh, in imagery. And so um, radiology, pathology, and oncology are about to be completely upended 
by these just seismic shifts that are occurring outside their four walls. And they're going to need um, technology tools to make sense of that. Um, and the challenge with the current ecosystem and the reason we launched Tempest is we, we didn't feel like people were even on the playing field to build those tools. You had people with you know, deep chemistry and biology expertise trying to play technician, and you had technicians trying to play doctor, and it was a disaster. I've heard you say also that the, one of the things that distinguishes Tempest from <clears throat> some of the other companies working in this space is that each of these components is brought under one roof at Tempest. Some companies focus on sequencing, some companies focus on data warehousing and integration, some companies focus on the business process functions that you described. Um, can you share with the audience why you think it's important to have all of these functions in one place? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the challenge is, and, and I think people in this room, if anyone you know, is deeply involved in cancer, you, you'll understand intimately, um, you know, doctors are overwhelmed just treating patients. And they, need, they just need solutions. And they can't deal with five or 10 different sub-solutions to get a solution. And so the, the, what they really want is, OK, if you're going to help me make sense of this data, if you're going to help me combine this clinical data with molecular data, then just do it and provide me something of value in return and, and do it in a way that I can digest that value in the course of my day when I'm treating patients. And the challenge is the way the system evolved, because nobody took a holistic approach, you had companies that were out there cleansing data. You had companies that were out there offering um, next generation sequencing. You had other companies out there that were doing analytics. And it was all just very disjointed and fragmented. And when we started, we said, in probably in a similar way that Apple designed a, a system of hardware and software in one, in one ecosystem, we said, look, we just need to get people the answer, and we'll do all the work internally. And that's, it's obviously resonated. Um, you know, we're only two years old, and we now have contracts signed with, I don't know, something like 75% of all NCI cancer centers in North America. So it's been a bit of a tsunami in terms of people saying, I want to work with you and bring this technology to my patients. So I think you, and our, that success is largely because we don't focus on um, making money off a test or charging uh, or making money off structuring data. We simply focus on you know, how can we bring technology to the hands of physicians and make their day easier? Without complicating their workflow, which many companies have, have been felled by the sword of complicated workflow, even if the solution they were trying to sell was, yeah. was highly valuable. Um, you've also used a, a metaphor that I really like uh, that uh, harkens back to aviation. You know, Tempest is not in pursuit of, of finding the cure to cancers. You're trying to do something much more foundational, uh, which is to improve the method by which decisions are made in the delivery of care. You've described the utility um, as a radar. Can you tell us what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you, if you think about it, the, the basic challenge is you could take almost, um, again, I'm only focused on cancer, but you could take almost any drug, any targeted oncotherapy or any drug, and typically, it, it works for some subset of patients and doesn't work for other, other subsets. And the question is always, well, who does it work for? And that's the, the holy grail of data is trying to figure out who is this patient, what drug are they taking, and how are they likely to respond? And so when you, when you can begin to stratify these subtypes of cancer into micro subsets based upon their molecular profile, what mutations do they have at a genomic level, what's happening at a transcriptomic level, what's happening at a proteomic level, you can begin to create these micro subsets and say, hey, this patient's HER2 mutated, but um, we know based on these phenotypic or molecular characteristics that you know, a th we have 1,000 patients among this giant repository of patients that we've been ingesting data. And we can tell you all these patients that look like your patient have never responded to Herceptin. And so they're likely in that category of people that won't respond. As a treating physician, I want to know that. Because it, it, at a bare, I may still, you know, if 2% of patients respond in that subset, I may still put the patient on Herceptin, but I'm going to, the duration upon which I, 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 I do that without revisiting the, the, the treatment, the therapeutic, it may be, it might be shorter. And so that basic process of bringing molecular insight to the, uh, to the, to the clinical process, I, 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 I think about like radar where we're asking uh, these doctors too often to make decisions without any data. It's like flying a plane into a thunderstorm without knowing it's there. If you just provide the data to the treating physician, often they'll be able to 
ingest that data and make a decision and say, okay, well, I'm going to stay away from that. It looks bad, especially when the NCCN guideline doesn't call for one particular therapeutic regimen versus another. You'll just move to where most patients like your patient are responding. And um, up until now, that was impossible. But because we can now can sequence people so inexpensively, because we can analyze data so inexpensively, because we can store data so inexpensively, these tools are going to show up and really upend, I think, and provide clarity into how um, these patients are treated. As most everyone in the room, I'm sure, could attest, one of the biggest challenges in healthcare, even in circumstances where the workflow is elegant and the need for the solution is urgent, there's a great deal of inertia, institutional inertia, in um, the willingness to actually interoperate and share data. Data liquidity is something that we've been talking about since health reform became a kitchen table topic, and it's, it's um, still some distance away, really. Tell us about how you've handled that particular issue with your partners in these academic medical centers and when the resistance to sharing data arises as it naturally does. Um, how do you handle it and how have you overcome that challenge? I mean, the first thing I'd say is it's, it, it's um, for, for somebody, I've been you know, in this now for about three years in totality, and if you, it, it's, all, it's almost, I mean, it sounds t terrible, but it's, it has, it's almost comical. If you, said, um, if you said to me three years ago, create a system that will make progress as hard as it could possibly be, like cre design a system to impede progress, I would almost design this system, right? Like it's, 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 it's evil genius in how it was designed. Um, I mean, every facet of it, right? I mean, how we store data, the, the decisions to like take all the physician progress notes and pathology reports and not structure that data, but structure other data. And let's create a system by which we reward people by publishing so they'll never, never share and we'll create all these weird patent rules. Like, it's just um, a remarkable system. And I think the challenge is um, uh, going, go, you know, trying to, within that system, get people to, um, change behavior and begin to share data is very hard. And I say this all the time as well. If you look at every kind of major technology paradigm shift that's influenced our life, at least over the last century, um, I can't think of one um, that was you know, kind of led by, from beginning to end, a committee or, or the government or some kind of cooperative process. Um, typically, at some point, private enterprise has to step in and build solutions that add value. And that's how you get a change of behavior. Um, and that's, especially on the consumer side, and that's what's gonna happen here. Whether it's Tempest or somebody else, you'll have a series of companies that really bring technology to the hands of physicians and researchers in a way that has never occurred. And that will change behavior. It'll change the physician's behavior. It'll ultimately change patient behavior because they'll start to demand and want this kind of technology. And what's been amazing for us is um, when we started Tempest two years ago, if you just said to me, how many academic medical centers or NCI cancer centers will you be, will you be able to get to share their data with you and let you retain a copy of that data in a de-identified manner for your use? I would have said you know, maybe two or three. I wouldn't have said almost all, right? And so um, I, I think it speaks to when you deliver real value, uh, it's a great trade for these providers, which is I'm happy to give you data in return for you giving me technology and value. But if you're not going to give them something in return, to expect them to just invest in giving you data is very hard. There's a cost to get the data. There's a cost to deal with these kind of partnerships. And so I think the public efforts have just largely failed because they, they're not honoring that kind of core trade that has to exist between provider or, or whatever company has the data and, and the party that wants the data. And so looking ahead, that sounds like uh, a significant uh, success milestone, just getting institutions to willingly and happily share their data. But looking ahead, what does success look like for Tempest? You know, right now we're singularly focused on, on building this data set. I mean, I, I don't know the right answer. I, I tend to think um, somewhere between, how, we, we refer to them as um, exomes of clinically annotated data, but it could be a large panel of clinically annotated data. Um, but I, I think somewhere between half a million, you know, exomes of clinically annotated data and a million, you'll begin this kind of um, really interesting 
era of insight where you'll begin to see all of these patterns emerge that were simply invisible but for scale. And those patterns will alter um, decision support in clinic and they'll alter the research we do. And so I'm kind of singularly focused on how do you get that data set. And we built a series of tools that allow us to, to do that. We, we, we can cleanse and structure clinical data using natural language processing and optical character recognition. From We can turn notes into structured data. We can turn images into structured data, whether it's anatomic pathology slides or you know, DICOM radiology scans. And so we have all these tools that turn that unstructured stuff into structured data. And then we built a lab to generate low cost, high coverage genomic and transcromic and proteomic data at low cost so that we can basically um, remove the friction to, to build that library. But the, what's next for us is staying singularly focused on getting that library built. And then we allow all of our partners to access that library in some capacity, um, to query it, to ask questions, to help them facilitate some of the research they're doing. And that's really the, the, the main focus. Obviously, there are many other areas of healthcare in addition to cancer where decision making um, at the point of care could be vastly improved. If you are able to build this library, um, do you see Tempest extending uh, this decision making tool, this comprehensive decision making platform to other areas of healthcare? Yeah, I mean, our, you know, again, we're very young, but our oldest. Um, uh, partners who've now been uh, maybe using our solution for 18 months or whatever are very vocal in asking, have, in asking us to extend into other uh, disease types, uh, uh, diabetes, infectious disease, neurological disorders. We get a ton of pressure, more pressure than um, you can imagine. And so um, at some point in 2018, I think we will probably take on one of those. Um, we, we, we need to look for um, a, a disease type where there are uh, a number of chemical combinations that can be given to a patient, so multiple FDA-approved drugs or multiple drugs in some stage of, of a clinical trial. That's also genomically oriented, where somebody might have a series of alterations that could lead to different combinatorial therapies or different um, uh, cocktails being being relevant. Because that's that's where the that's the you know where the data gets most interesting is when you can begin to align these things that historically were not aligned. So, but yeah, somewhere in 2018, I think we'll like we start to expand. Well, I'm sure I speak for most of the people in the room when I say we look forward to that moment because there are lots of areas where uh, decision making can be improved and we all look forward to that day. Thank you so much for your Thanks. time, Eric. Thanks for having me. For listening.